Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Resia tonight. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome Maria Gomez Lopez. Are you there, Maria? Hi. <laughs> Who is in Madrid? Maria is an alumna of SOS, having gained an MA in the history of art and architecture of the Islamic Middle East. And she is now completing a PhD at the Universidad Complutense in Madrid. She combines her research, professional and teaching practice at the History of Art Department of that university with the fellowship of the Spanish Ministry of Higher Education. She has been research visitor at American University in, uh, of Beirut at Paris on Pantheon Sorbonne, and she has shared the results of her work in different publications and academic events. Recently, in 2021, she has curated the exhibition Un Mundo de Retales, or A World of Snippets, at Casa Arabe in Madrid, which featured four contemporary uh, artists on the history and experience of spaces, on memory and lost lands. Um, in her current project, Maria explores the convergence of art and cartography in contemporary art production from the Arab world, paying particular attention to the stories of the territory linked to personal experiences. Uh, Maria has kindly uh, agreed to answer questions at the end of her talk. Please write them in the chat. Uh, you can write them during the, the talk or uh, immediately after the, uh, the end. And uh, well, uh, welcome Maria and over to you. Hi, good afternoon. You can hear me? Yes. Is it fine? Okay. With new headphones, I, I just <laughs> borrowed. <laughs> Let me share my screen. First of all, there we go. There we go. You can see the screen, right? Okay. Yes. Let me check. I can see a few faces there. So there we go. If there is any problem uh, with sound or image, please let me know before I keep on, but I think it's, it should work. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction, Anna. You explained it very well, <laughs> actually, what I do and what I've been doing recently. Um, I also wanted to thank this uh, invitation to, to this seminar. Uh, it's a pity that it has to be virtual, but I'm very, very happy to share with uh, people linked to SOAS uh, what I've been doing in the past uh, few years. Uh, because many of the things I, I have uh, been working on, many of the paths that I worked uh, have a lot to do with uh, what I studied and I researched at uh, my year uh, at SOAS. Um, what I will be presenting today is uh, first a brief overview of the research that, I, that I've been doing as part of my dissertation that I will be defending, inshallah, in a month or a month and a half. And also, as this is a seminar of work in progress, I made an effort in presenting uh, the projects I'm currently involved on and um, that have to do with the dissertation. First, uh, I will explain very briefly the exhibition I curated um, and that opened in last Oct October. And second, I will talk to you very briefly about uh, the transformation of my dissertation into a children's book. Um, a challenge that um, allowed me to, to somehow uh, approach a completely different audience and that gave me the opportunity to jump out of academia. Um, so uh, basically, as Anna said, what I explored in this dissertation was uh, the convergence of art and cartography in the Arab world today. The aim was basically to examine how different artists were trying to complement and reinvent conventional ways of representing the world, so mainly maps, through their personal experience of the territory. 
This 13 point uh, was an awareness that uh, in art, uh, in contemporary art from the Arab world, but also from many other places in the last decades, many artists have turned to uh, canonical cartography, have subverted uh, the familiar maps and have tried first to propose a critical look to this uh, canonic narrative. Second, they have tried to reinvent these ways we have of describing the spaces we inhabit. Um, so basically, maybe what we could say is the first question I had with the research is, what is it that maps don't tell that we really need to produce so many other narratives that convey everything that is left behind? So I'm not sure how uh, things are in the UK. Uh, in Spain, we grow completely surrounded by maps. At the schools, we have to learn by heart all the capital cities. We have to learn the rivers, mountains, valleys. And uh, basically, we are even taught that the world is exactly how it's represented in maps. However, this is not so. This is something that I've learned during these years of research. Maps have proven to be subjective and selective processes and not objective and comprehensive representations of the world. Probably their familiar visual language and their reputation as precise artifacts can be traced back to the 17th, 18th century Europe. Um, this is the moment when first cartography is consolidated as a scientific discipline, its codes are articulated and expanded. And second is the moment when imperialist expansion starts to take place and maps pay, uh, play a central role in it. It is at this moment that maps become great tools of control and also symbols of power. They are collected in, uh, personal, uh, in personal archives, in collections, they are hanged in private and public spaces, they appear in uh, paintings. Um, it's interesting because this use of maps um, for this imperialist expansion is described uh, by researchers such as uh, Harley or Estrella de Diego uh, in this way. In so far as maps were used in colonial promotion and lands claimed on paper before they were effectively occupied, maps anticipated empire. If in previous centuries, Estrella says, maps had been a mirror of reality, in those years, reality started to be the reflection of the maps. So basically, this is when the map and its enunciative and performative power starts to be, uh, wait, I can't go to next, uh, start to be evidenced. Um, however, as I said, maps, understood in their most conventional sense, have always coexisted with other territorial expressions. As Mariana Macera says, to walk paths, to whistle territories, to create stories, to pray, to dance, or to draw maps, are activities that have occupied men over time, tracing invisible networks of meaning to express through their lived or imagined experience their relationship with the world. This means that we have needed to develop different ways of express the spaces, the spaces we inhabit and the ways we do so. Many of these other special narratives that accompany more canonic maps were to be retrieved in the 20th century. Before, they were often dismissed for their supposedly subjective and imprecise nature. But in the middle of the special and many other turns, um, all these assumptions about cartography and maps as being precise artifacts start to be questioned. And also this has a lot to do with the fact that place starts to be considered not as a static location, but as a process, as a construct that people redefine all the time through different interactions, gestures, and the different ways of being in the world. So basically many researchers will say, okay, if place is a construct, is, if it's impermanent um, uh, redefinition, maybe we cannot count on a definitive representation of it. So what we need is, let's say, a plural constellation of images that is open to change, that is fragmentary, that it's ephemeral. So at this point, art starts to be a central tool, not only to look, to critically look at this more familiar and conventional cartography, but also to reinvent and to reinsert in the map everything the map does not tell. 
I just uh, put these uh, two very well-known images, America Invertida, the South America uh, turned upside down by Torres Garcia in the middle of post-colonial drifts and identity definitions. And then on the right, uh, this reformulation of the map of the world by the surrealists, just as, as two examples you might be familiar with. The Arab world is uh, is not an exception in those in all these um, let's say look at maps, both critically and in a uh, with a, a need of reinvention. This, uh, of course, might come at no surprise because territorially and geographically speaking, the Arab world it's a quite controversial region. To a great extent, it is the result of overlapping agreements and cartographic proposals from colonial and post-colonial times. As Karin Kulkasi puts it, the modern Arab world is the result of a disordered mapping exercise. Of course, in the colonial period, maps were extensively used by European and other powers to organize and control the territories. And in this sense, as I said, maps were not only representing, but anticipating and producing space. I just uh, brought as a reference the Sykes-Picot map uh, that accompanied uh, the agreement with the same name in 1916. And on the right, I just brought this uh, parody, Badi Dalul does of uh, these moments of overlapping agreements, redefinitions. Uh, what you can see here is just um, a screenshot of a video in where uh, different hands redraw a crumbling Ottoman Empire insistently until the edge of absurdity. Many of these colonial uh, proposals would be naturalized in the second half of the 20th century, which is a moment of independence and statehood. It's a moment of post-colonial drift and also of national, transnational, regional, um, ideological and political movements that of course tried to produce um, let's say more indigenous territorial enunciations that were to be articulated around supposedly common elements. Of course, one of these proposals will be the Arab world that was mainly constructed in the framework of pan-Arabism and that coexisted with many other geographical proposals. It's interesting because Karen Kulkasi, sorry for the microphone, Karen Kulkasi did a very interesting uh, research on the maps that were produced in Arab countries in Arabic in these times. And she discovers that uh, this is a moment when the Arab world is, becomes a sort of logo. It's represented with the silhouette delineated and thus separated from the rest of the world. And in some cases, the national boundaries um, that separate the countries are erased. So somehow this Arab world becomes a metonymy, first of a territory, usually understood as the 22 Arab states that compose also other um, institutions such as the Arab League. And second, it's a metonymy of a transnational community that variably feels connected to some of the common elements that vaguely define Arabness. So basically this counter cartography would somehow um, talk about all these post-colonial drifts, all these uh, debates around identity, around auto-determination, and the maps will play a central role in it. So it's not strange that maps, especially in arts, will play also a central role in the 90s, when ongoing internal conflicts, massive displacements, and the effect of a radical globalization will lead to question the currency of an Arab world as a whole, another world as a unified region, at least as it was represented in previous maps and as it was trying to be articulated in the previous decade. So basically, this had an impact in the maps, uh, in the arts, sorry. So from the 90s until our days, many artists will start to subvert and also to reinvent the ways we have of telling the Arab, but also many other worlds that compose it. In my dissertation, I analyzed a selection of these artworks. Uh, so basically I built a sort of an archive. I tried to give it sense. Uh, so finally what I did was to establish three central chapters in which I gather a group of quite heterogeneous works that somehow share uh, in a way um, possible means of uh, approaching the territories either from a critical look or from a personal experience. 
I would like to say here, I won't stop a lot in methodology. Of course, I did a bibliographical review. I did my research studies, field work, and so on. But I wanted to, um, to uh, share with you that one of the main, 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 and most important resources I found was the conversations with specialists, curators, academics, but especially with the artists uh, whose projects I analyzed. So basically, um, in these uh, projects I worked on, we can uh, differentiate first uh, the projects in which the artists uh, explicitly go back to that Arab world as a logo, Arab world as a unity, and what they try to express or to materialize are all these fissures, all these cracks that somehow since the 90s are, are, um, are leading to question the currency of this notion of the Arab world as a whole. So among these artists, we can find, uh, for example, Moad Nasser, who has devoted a lot of his artworks and recent projects to explore the special impact of uh, these um, overlapped cartographic proposals. One of the projects he, he did was the Shattered Glass. I, I think it's very visually explicit in which we see this other world isolated from the rest of the world, made in Shattered Glass, and thus covered by all these fissures that somehow seem to evoke how this world might disintegrate, at least in this image of, uh, uh, of a unity. You know? On the right, you have the, the 22 untitled by, um, I'm going to try to minimize this. There we go. The 22 untitled The Arab World by Marwan Reshmawi, which is an installation in black rubber uh, that was commissioned for an exhibition in Egypt, for which uh, the artist interviewed his dad, who lived for a while in Egypt uh, in the past century. So basically, he realizes that the Arab world that his dad talks about and uh, that he uh, once lived and has nothing to do with contemporary Arab world. And what he does is trying to translate all these fissures, all these differences in this big installation, in which what we can see is that this Arab world is transformed into a sort of archipelago, in which the different national borders separate very clearly each of the countries. Some other artists will go a step forward, and we, we uh, and will actually um, and will actually work on um, more unfeasible geographical uh, reinventions. One is Bashar al Hoop and his "The Arab World Is My Homeland." The title is taken from an Al Barudi song that used to be sung in Pan Arab times. He himself uh, sang it uh, at school in Palestine before uh, at first time in the morning. And what he does is to do a sort of parodic game of this Arab world is my homeland. The song says something like from Oman to Yemen, from Morocco to Palestine, we are just one and the Arab world is my homeland. So uh, Bashar takes this and what he does is to produce an Arab world that is not only fragmented, but is transformed into a sort of vertical region with border precipices that completely disconnect each of the countries. And in a uh, interactive proposal, uh, Oraib Tukan will produce her newer Middle East. It's an installation uh, in which the Arab countries are the result of superimposing two real cartographic proposals to redefine the Middle East. First, the Sykes Picot signed in uh, 1916. Second, the one proposed in 2006 by Lieutenant Ralph Peters. And what she does is to take the countries that result from this superimposition, transform the countries into magnets, and invite the visitor to produce a newer Middle East. So she invites to do this game of cartography, she invites to uh, redefine it. And finally, I brought this geographical child's play just uh, because it was a proposal the Saudi duo Brick Lab did for London in 2019. I'm not sure if any of you had the chance to see it, but it was an installation uh, that was located in three different parts of the city. And basically the idea was to produce an Arab world with these pastel color seats in which the spectators could actually, as they say, do uh, improbable um, alliances by sitting, talking and doing sort of, um, let's say, agreements, uh, let's say talks, no? Um, in a way, again, um, giving the, the visitor the power of redefining that Middle East. 
Um, in this species, I, I bet you can see that uh, cartography operates both as an object and tool of reflection. So that's why in the dissertation I called these or I somehow uh, gathered them as meta cartographies. So basically those pieces that um, do a mimetic use of cartography to think of the practice itself and its effects. However, despite their critical approach, none of the projects offer an alternative territorial expression. They challenge this regional imagery. I think uh, many of these artists actually say they are um, not identified with this kind of other world as a logo does not represent the experience they have of the territory they inhabit in the other world. So um, basically uh, they do this critic, but they don't propose another way of um, rebuilding it or of, of uh, uh, re-enunciating. However, I, of course, uh, did my research. I, uh, I kept on reading and uh, doing research on the different artists who worked with maps. And I found that there were many, many other artists that dive into the processes behind a spatial definition and find another way of uh, conveying them. Many of them will use cartographic language and we subverted it in a way that we can recognize these pieces as maps, but of course they are not canonical maps. Um, the first example I brought is uh, the Wandering City series by Dina Diwan, a series uh, in which she creates a cartographic portrait of Beirut inspired in her teenager journals. Written before fleeing the, the country during civil war, in her journals, uh, Dina elaborately describes the itineraries followed within the city to walk the dog, the dog, visit her grandma, go to the beach, go to school, whatever. But every special movement is registered in this journal. So, th so 30 years later, when Dina recovers these journals, uh, she paints and embroiders these maps of a city which, of course, it's articulated around memories, movements, narratives, and an embodied experience of place, but that doesn't exist anymore as such. You might uh, know this uh, eight-channel video installation by Bushra Khalili called the Mapping Journey Project, in which eight clandestine migrants share the journeys taken, undertaken in different parts of the Mediterranean to get to their current destinies. In the meanwhile, while they're telling the journeys they followed, they paint over a, a canonical map the route they followed to get to where they are. So basically what they do is not only subvert a canonic map, but uh, overlap to this common uh, geography and experiential one um, that in the epilogue of the project, the artist isolates from the map and transforms into a constellation. Of course, this is a gesture that refers not only to celestial charts that might uh, guide nocturnal sailors, but it's also a gesture that uh, deploys an alternative map based on an embodied experience. Um, I also brought the examples of, of the work by Christine Gideon uh, in series like her Aleppo Deconstruction Reconstruction. Christine uh, left uh, Syria when she was very, very young, and she grew up surrounded by family memories and stories about this uh, now vanishing country, as she describes it. She only got to visit it once when as an adult, and at some point she decided to do a sort of maps of, um, of, um, different, uh, of different places of the country. So basically, in this Aleppo uh, deconstruction, reconstruction, she elaborates an urban archive of these different places. And then on the black plaques uh, you have on the right, she writes the memories and stories her family and friends share with her. So basically, the result is a collection of maps of lived and remembered spaces, but also uh, of various times, generation, and stories that have defined them. She takes a step forward and in her stitched works, she will reinterpret this aerial view of the map and she will devote at least four maps to the different places she visited when she was in the country. This is uh, very interesting because she actually reinvents cartography, proposing a very particular way of preserving Syria through mapping, mending and patching. Of course, this kind of project reinvents the consolidated cartographic lexicon to accommodate overlooked narratives of place. 
These narratives are articulated around particular special practices, memories, and imageries that define both who we are and the spaces we inhabit. And for this reason, as I think you can guess by now, I have called them throughout the dissertation cartobiographies, which is a concept coined by Antonio Jesus Palacios Ortiz to refer to, refer to experiential mappings. However, not all these cartobiographies necessarily take up the linguistic codes of the map. Some artists will dive into new ways of documenting the world and it's especially its inhabiting processes. In this sense, the pieces I'm going to show now, they don't focus in the shape of the world and try to visually convey it, but they actually do on the processes behind them. Uh, for this reason, what I propose throughout the dissertation is that these cartobiographies might allow, enable us to look to the river side of the map. This is to all these processes that lie behind it, that define the territories that are later represented on them, but that somehow are not explicitly mentioned in this uh, surface we are all uh, so familiar uh, with. Uh, of course, these pieces might not be strictly understood as maps, but they may enable us to think of them in a more flexible way. In orientations, Ismail Bahri wandered through the Medina of Tunis with a glass full of black ink in his hand. The inky surface reflects urban fragments as the artist moves, and uh, thus, considering the symbolism of the black ink as writing tool, the video might be understood as a performative geography or earth writing practice, an enterprise that is not and, and is, is undertaken not only with ink and paper, but also through the gestures we make and uh, the ways we have of being in the world. This emphasis on the gestures that shape the territory um, is uh, what uh, Dictaphone Group do uh, in Nothing to Declare, which is a research project and a performance on the history and the special practices associated with the now defunct railway service that once crossed the Arab world. So basically, each of the members depart from Beirut in a different um, in a different direction in Lebanon, north, east, and south, getting to the not always penetrable borders with the neighbor countries. In their way, they visit abandoned or reformed stations, they follow the race, they gather testimonies and stories associated with the times the train was operative. What they do later is a performance in which uh, they share all these stories and they map the special transformations the railway and its later dismantling have brought to the territory and its inhabitants. And in the process, what they aim at is embodying the what the times and places we can see now once were and what they could be if people claimed this railway to be operative again. Finally, a final example of, of this cartobiography uh, that focuses on gesture, on interaction, on inhabiting, are the video installations My Fatherlands or Trace the Territory by Sineb Sedira. Um, in this video, the artist dives into the history of the lands her family owned in Algeria before they left uh, to France. In the project, what she does is to superimpose images of herself and her father walking the plot, talking about the past, counting the steps they take. But these images overlap, as you can see on the images, with the documents and maps Sedira films in archives and in the registry. So basically what she does is to embody an historical narrative and a special practice to evoke the multiple elements that dialectically define the territory, its inhabitants and its narratives. So of course, as you can see, these pieces do not constitute an exact and systematized portrait of physical territories. They rather variously dive into some of the untold practices that continuously shape them. In the process, they produce a special narrative that comes to complement and reinvent more conventional ones, or maybe to show what has always lied behind them. 
as a brief uh, slide I made for uh, retrospective reflections, uh, things I thought about when I finished this work, when I started looking back at what I had uh, written. Uh, I, I say that, of course, all these multiple and uh, evolving accounts of place are not something exclusive from the Arab world and it's not something uh, that is exclusive from uh, our times. Art and cartography have encountered in many moments in history and they have had very particular relationships um, in other centuries too. However, in this 20th century, this look is critical. It's, a, it's an intrinsic look to the processes that uh, create these narratives of the territory. And what is interesting is that many artists from different places in the last decade are producing these sort of cartographic reinventions. And thus we might think that they are articulating a sort of a global atlas. Leaning on art on experience, this atlas challenges and reinvents the way we have of telling the world. Of course, this doesn't imply that conventional maps are not useful anymore, <laughs> just that the narratives they convey and with them their own nature are being amplified. As, a, as, as you have seen, I'm very interested in the centrality of lived experience. So basically how to land the aerial view and tell the world from uh, the lived experience. Because I believe uh, this uh, personal experience comes to assert the human and imaginary side of cartography. But also because this centrality evidences that our dwelling rituals are what shape the places, the histories and the stories we tell. And thus that these spatial practices should be quite conscious and critical. Precisely in this sense, these cartobiographies may also enable us to transcend some of the rigid geographical and mental lines that for centuries maps have consolidated, inviting us to develop other possible territorial bonds, practices and imageries. In relation to the Arab world, Diana Nawi would express something similar in Ibras. She said, but before we throw out our maps, burdened as they are, is it possible to redraw and to rethink them? Can we find use in them as open metaphors and generative platforms that serve not to calcify an idea of a region, but rather help us to locate meaning within the contours of a broader world? And here uh, starts the last part, which is, uh, is, uh, is not as long as uh, the previous one. This is the one that has to do with the work in progress. And uh, this is the, the part that uh, somehow opens to all the uncertainties uh, one has when finishes a dissertation and thinks, well, is there a life beyond the PhD? Is there life beyond academia? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure, I can't, I can't tell now, but uh, I will share with you these uh, very brief reflections about what I would love to do in the future and what I'm uh, doing and I will be doing in the, in the very, very short future. Uh, first, of course, I would love to resume all the pending projects that especially COVID um, didn't allow me to finish especially all the conversations I couldn't have, all the stays I couldn't do, and finally the trips that um, have uh, remained on the email and on the uh, to-do list, and that would help me to, um, of course, um, uh, develop more this research. Uh, in a more theoretical way, I would love to transcend uh, the, the regional framework to dive into more local context, not only countries or cities, but I put there also neighborhoods, uh, even a street or a house, and to try to see you know, how these uh, artistic creations operate or complement uh, perceptions on more small um, territories. Um, in terms of regions, I would love to see what's going on in Latin America, uh, because I think it has a very historical, uh, very similar historical drift to the Arab world. I have been reading in parallel. Of course, I didn't have to do two PhDs at the same time. One is enough. But uh, Latin America, it's uh, a region that I'm very interested in, uh, in terms of art and cartography. But of course, uh, and uh, in a very coherent um, gesture, I would love to transcend territorial categories and look, I say, at disparate works, 
works that maybe transcend definitely these cartographic languages and that uh, I don't need to compare what they propose to previous narratives, just works that express the territory in explicit and ex exclusive maybe experiential way. The last uh, two objectives are maybe more utopic, but one of them actually happened. So I remain confident. The first is to go, of course, beyond academic uh, boundaries and to do an applied research. We all inhabit uh, daily. I mean, we are all in permanent interaction with places. Everything happened in a place. We are every day sharing the territories we, um, we are in. So basically, I would love to be more conscious of the ways I particularly am in the world and also the way I share my world with other people. And also um, beyond academia, I would like to um, experiment other methods, other languages, other platforms to reach to different audiences and somehow see what this dissertation can do in these other worlds. So this is the last uh, part of uh, this talk, uh, because as I anticipated, uh, this is something that actually happened before I could defend. Um, of course, an exhibition, it has a lot to do with academia too, but it's a different platform. Um, I uh, curated this exhibition uh, that in Spanish, as I, Anna very well pronounced, I was very surprised. It's, uh, it's entitled Un Mundo de Retales, and it was vaguely translated as a world of snippets. Uh, retal in Spanish has to do with patchwork. It's a piece of textile, it's a fragment, but it has a very positive view because you can actually join it to other retales and create something completely different and you can get a different view of that uh, initial retal. You will understand why this is the title. Uh, when I was uh, invited to make a proposal about, uh, about my dissertation to be exhibited at Casa Arabe, which by the way, it's a very interesting um, institution, it's a public institution, part of the diplomatic system in Spain. Um, when I was uh, invited, I was actually working on the conclusions of the PhD. So I was uh, thinking about how the world is made by these permanent overlapped interactions, how, of course, it is under permanent construction, which evidences that it might not be possible to produce a definitive image, cartographic or not, of it. So at the same time, in this crazy writing moment, I was reading a beautiful book by uh, Graciela Esperanza. It's a book uh, that is uh, translated something, as something like um, Portable Atlas of Latin America. And she speaks of a networked making of the world. So basically how the world is interwoven, how the world is full of interactions between people, places and times. So this idea of the network, this idea of interwaving somehow rang a bell and my proposal was, okay, let's work on my dissertation topic you are now familiar with, but from a textile perspective, let's translate this idea of interwaving um, through, um, through textile. So uh, basically the proposal I made was to bring these four artists you can see on the screen, Amina Aksnay, Asma Lisa, Christine Gideon, and Phil Wanasser. The four of them presented projects that were um, either um, made with um, textile techniques or using textile materials. And all of them articulate various personal and experiential narratives of different places uh, they have inhabited or they have a connection to. I don't have the time to explain um, very thoroughly each of the projects, but I just wanted to show you some of these images uh, and to uh, just, uh, I mean, I'm very thankful to these four artists and I think the best uh, way I can think is also sharing the projects they brought to Spain. The first one is Asma Elisa, whose projects uh, overlap the images of the Iraqi rivers and date palms, both central elements of her connection to a land, Iraq, she left when she was young and she never revisited. 
The second artist is a Saudi designer and uh, an artist uh, who is Filwan Aser. Her projects are related to the architectural and textile boundaries the body daily inhabits. She reflects on the way the body adapts to and interacts with these uh, different uh, limits that uh, we daily, um, we daily um, perform. I already talked about Christine Gideon and uh, her maps on a vanishing Syria reconstructed through family and personal stories, memories and imageries. And finally, we also counted with the presence of Amina Aksnai. She's an amazing uh, architect and artist who presented this garden inside. It was an installation that reflects on the interaction between the inner and outer world and how both dialectically define each other. Um, this is a very brief uh, visit to the virtual visit to the exhibition. This is the first time I do this uh, virtual visit. If someone uh, has the opportunity to traveling to of traveling to Cordoba, the exhibition finished last Sunday in Madrid. Today uh, we disinstalled, and uh, next week uh, we will open um, at the at Casa Arabe headquarters in Cordoba, which is a beautiful Mudejar house, and that I'm sure uh, the exhibition will magically work there. And uh, finally, I will close with this last crazy project that takes me, I think, far uh, from academia even. And that was a huge, huge challenge, even I think more than the exhibition, because implied, uh, of course, uh, speaking uh, and sharing my dissertation otherwise. Uh, this is a children's book that I wrote uh, with my uh, very, very talented sister. She's an architect, designer, uh, teacher. I mean, I, I can promise she's the talented one. So basically, we collaborated to publish uh, this book as part of a drama research group, which is uh, the group I've, I've been part of in the past years. Um, the book is uh, entitled in Spanish, Lo que esconden los mapas, otras formas de contar el mundo, which is vaguely translated in English as uh, what maps conceal other ways of describing the world. So basically, uh, the idea of this book was uh, first uh, to elaborate a story that reflected on how maps operate. So basically, we tried uh, with the supervision of, um, uh, of teachers and I don't know how you say in English, pedagogos, uh, people who uh, work on peda pedagogy, I guess. I'm not sure if I'm making it up. Uh, so basically, uh, what we did was first a narrative story in which we questioned actually this ability of maps to tell the world we inhabit and the way we do it. So uh, we tried to transmit this fact that many of the spaces children and adults, of course, occupy are not reflected in maps as such. So what we proposed, you can see in those big letters, was to do these uh, maps from below. So basically, we invite the reader to produce um, his or her own maps. The turtle is the narrator. Uh, it's one of the stars of the constellation Lira. So we didn't want to take something from the map. We took it from the sky where there are no borders painted yet, or not as much as, in the, uh, as on Earth. And you can see the turtle, of course, is upside down. So basically what we proposed is this idea that maybe if we all do a collaborative atlas, maybe if I put my world together with yours and if we have all these voices brought together, maybe we can produce a more exact and a more, uh, let's say, polyphonic narrative of this uh, changing world. But of course, we didn't do, we didn't, we didn't send all this homework to children to go to your house and do maps. So we also did that exercise and uh, we spent many months drawing our own maps and thinking of all the things that conventional maps, the ones we have at home, the ones we use when we travel, the ones we were taught at school, don't tell. So I just brought uh, this example as a way of closing uh, my intervention, which is uh, one of the maps we, we made. It's uh, entitled uh, My Yesterday Day, My Yesterday, or something like that, Media de Ayer. So what I did yesterday, it's a map in time. So basically, we tried to conceal the different spaces and activities one can do during the day. 
and uh, that of course uh, are so ephemeral that are not always represented in any map. No. So uh, basically, I I just wanted to bring these uh, two reinventions, two trips the dissertation took. Uh, to show that uh, the research, even though if in the form of dissertation is done, uh, it's in permanent evolution, and especially that it's uh, still taking me to many different people, places, and formats, and that uh, maybe my, let's say, uh, prospective conclusion, my wish, my desire, is that uh, it keeps uh, me doing so. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any comments or questions or whatever. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really interesting and, and so full of imaginations and full of ideas. Uh, and I really love the, the children uh, project. <laughs> so yeah, fantastic, fantastic thank project. You. Um, Please do write your points and questions in the chat. And while um, we're waiting for that, um, I was, um, uh, you know, you talked about uh, that artist, Christine Gideon, who mm -hmm. works on Syria. And I was reminded uh, of the artist Tiffany Chung. I don't know if you know her. Mm -hmm. yeah? And, and in particular, the Syria project uh, that she has about 40 maps where the artist is mapping the colonial history linked to the MENA region, which affected obviously greater Syria. So she's mapping conflicts, displacement, the migration movements uh, caused by war. And in doing so, she reveals narratives and, and, and histories of, of the people involved. Um, but to do that, she also needs to the contribution of the communities. So she establishes, you know, centers in which the communities have various activities and they contribute to this idea of, of a map. Um, so I just want, wanted to know whether you, you had any reflections on, uh, if you know her work and if you had any reflections on that and whether sort of it echoes any of the work you are doing. Uh, and the other aspect that she um, brings in is that of gender. So the element of gender, which hasn't come through your seminar, but I wonder whether you are also thinking about that. Uh, thank you, Anna. Yeah, I, I have to write down. I have a very, uh, <laughs> very poor memory for short time. I mean, for these questions, I just uh, sure, take some sure. notes. So, uh, with the co regarding community mapping or or the importance of community, it's uh, I, many of the artists I've talked to, uh, they have uh, worked on this uh, idea not only of um, of gathering testimonies and experiences, but also have literally worked on uh, collective maps and in fact it, there is something uh, this is something that uh, they reivindicate um, a lot but I think of course maps I mean there is no maps are always produced collectively in a way I mean of course gathering the information and passing uh, passing it through whatever territory time there is not only one person producing a map i think a map is a collective action in any case but is uh the the change is what kind of community is involved in producing that map if it's a uh, let's say a political group no or a selection of uh, scientists or whatever instead of the people who are inhabiting daily those territories and also, I, I don't remember the names of two artists I came across in the, I mean, when I was finishing the dissertation, I, one was working from France about Morocco and uh, the other one, I don't remember. I couldn't work on their, on their projects, but they were doing very interesting things with um, an alphabet people and the potential of uh, expressing their territory in a graphic way. 
And it, it was super interesting. They made a lot of workshops. I mean, if anyone is interested, I can have a look and, and retrieve their names. But I was very, very interested about this idea of uh, people who don't uh, read or write or um, are not familiar with these more conventional languages, how they express uh, in a graphic way their worlds. And regarding gender, it's uh, something I always avoid. <laughs> Because I think it's a very, um, it's a slippery thing. Of course, uh, many artists, especially the artists from the exhibition, that has been a great question all the time. Why for women? What has to do, I mean, why women doing maps? And why women waving? I mean, uh, which is a very, uh, a technique that is quite uh, linked and associated with a female world, no? Uh, it's something that has come across the, the, the dissertation, of course, and especially this contrast between uh, more canonical mappings being done mainly by uh, male um, collectives and uh, many of these counter mappings being made by women. I still have to further explore that topic. Uh, but of course, I think uh, there is a, a gender dimension in all these, uh, especially because also um, many of what, what they're claiming is not an impositive language, is not a codified one, is something that has more to do with intuition, it's something that has more to do with um, handicrafts, uh, with things that somehow, until very recently at least, uh, have been connected more to a female than male world. But um, it's uh, a garden I didn't want to step into because I was in too many gardens <laughs> at that point. But I think it's a very interesting question and it's something I definitely have to, to go back. I, I think for the following seminar, I will put it in the slide of perspective conclusions. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, we have um, a couple of um, uh, questions in the chat. So Giada Vercelli uh, says, pre-colonial Australia was the last landmass on earth inhabited, not by herdsmen, farmers, but by hunter-gatherers. As told by Bruce Chatwin in the song lines, the building of infrastructure erased the topographical references Aboriginal people used as a reference for survival and invalidated their oral culture as Aboriginal people used songs to pass these topographical references from one generation to the next. Have you come across any evidence that a similar process has happened also in the GCC countries after they converted their economic model from pastoral to the exploitation of hydrocarbon resources in the 1960s? And what do you expect to happen now that they are converting their economic model from the focus on resources underground to the resources overground? Well, that, this is a long uh, text. Okay. I have to uh, reread uh, a bit. So, okay, can you see the chat? Yes. Yes. Yes, I can okay. see. Wait, I will do it bigger because otherwise I won't see it. I, I, by the way, I, I recently discovered this uh, song lines uh, by Chatwin uh, by a very, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Jada is, the, is your name. I'm not sure if, uh, if you understand Spanish. No? Yes. Uh, there is a podcast uh, that is called Cabinete de Curiosidades. And it's a podcast where I discovered uh, this, actually this book by Chatwin. Uh, she's an amazing woman and she speaks a lot about culture, art and, and many, I mean, many different things. It's very, it's very easy uh, podcast. So I go back to your question. Um, let me see in the sector race. I didn't, I didn't see uh, this happened in the, uh, in the Gulf. I mean, I, I, can't, uh, I can't talk about a very explicit uh, or a very specific example, uh, but uh, I really, I'm really, really, really interested about this idea of the oral culture as a way of building a topographical knowledge. And I have uh, particularly worked on an artist you might know, who is Jumana Emil Abut. 
uh, she's a Palestinian artist and uh, she's uh, trying to rebuild uh, the land that's, that's being erased uh, through a folk tale and oral tradition. So uh, when Anna was reading this text, uh, somehow I thought of uh, Yumana and this interest she has of remapping in uh, a non-cartographic way uh, this disappearing land. And she has a beautiful project in which she is recovering all those magical places that are mentioned in the stories that women used to tell at home. Uh, these places actually have a, a correspondence in reality. I mean, the well where you can get immortality in this tale is in this village. So what she's doing is going to these villages and try to do this mapping of a sort of a more indigenous knowledge of all these people that used to go to that well to ask for immortality. So I I can't uh, I can't share with you an example re uh, related to the Gulf, but uh, but uh, this is something that fascinated me for a very long time uh, with uh, with uh, with Palestine specifically. And um, oof, what do I expect? I have I, I mean I that's a big question. <laughs> I mean, I have, I can't, I can't answer that. I'm, I'm sorry. I have, uh, I have no idea. There is, I guess you know, you might know this project uh, by. Um, wait, what's his name? Uh, I will say it. Uh, is this Lebanese photographer who uh, traveled the Gulf countries, uh, producing an archive of all the carcasses, all the abandoned buildings related with uh, the oil industry. And he was trying to do a sort of an archive of this uh, black geography, as he says, uh, that has completely transformed, um, that has completely transformed the landscape. And he is, oh my God, I'm not going to remember it, but I can, ah, Siad Antar, Siad Antar. See, uh, wait, I will write it here. See it under. And he does uh, this project on, on, on the Gulf and it's, it's, it's all uh, the shoreline. He travels there and he's just like taking these pictures of how this, let's say, thing coming from underground is transforming what happens over ground. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Hamid Kashmir Shekhan. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. I wonder if you could elaborate a little more on the difference between the first category, subversive approach, and the second, intervention and reinvention. How would you distinguish them? Also, I'm curious if, if you have included uh, Weil Shauki's fantastical remapping of Arab history. Thank you, um, Hamid. I... I'm very happy you are in this talk and now I'm a bit nervous actually. I, <laughs> I have read you a lot. <laughs> so actually you are in the pages of, of that dissertation and that's also in the, in the previous slides. <laughs> so thank you so much. And Karim Pinto I'm seeing also too. Um, uh, that's a, a very good question about uh, this contrast. Of course, um, this is uh, something a uh, reviewer of the PhD said. Uh, the dissertation um, took a very intuitive uh, path. I mean, in academia, we are required to do all this uh, theoretical framework methodology and all these things, but I have a very intuitive uh, way of doing. And then when I look back, I build all these frameworks retrospectively. So for me, uh, these kind of categories were a way of uh, somehow classifying these different groups that uh, allowed me to evoke uh, the kind of gesture they did regarding cartography. So maybe what I can say is that in the subversive approach, the artists are willingly um, deconstructing cartography in a critical way. They are actually not happy with uh, the representations cartography make of the territories they inhabit or they are um, interacting with somehow. And I think the reinvention has more to do with a need of telling something else. Of course, they are too connected. It's not that they are completely opposite. Uh, many of the artists that are reinventing cartography do so by subverting it. And many of the artists that subvert it, I personally don't think that they reinvent. They don't propose something else. They move the pieces of the map. They uh, do so to offer a 
critic, but I don't think they're proposing a new way of telling the world or they're not trying to convey a different narrative. So I think the difference might be that. And uh, I haven't included uh, this project, which I really love. And uh, I have it in the, I mean, I have like the archive I worked on and then the infinite catalog that uh, of projects that I didn't have the time to go through. But, uh, but definitely it's a, it's, a, it's a very good project to, to deal with in the terms of my dissertation. Thank you so much for, for, the, for the message. Thank you. Um, Karen Pinto, why not consider Islamic maps? Not all are medieval, uh, copies continue into the 19th and 20th centuries. Some contemporary artists have included these maps in their artwork. I'm puzzled why you've left them out. Thanks for a talk rich with images. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> So uh, that's a great, great, great question. Actually, uh, even medieval maps, I, I would also be very happy to, to dive into, but of course I didn't have the, not only the expertise and also the energy to go from archive to, to archive, but I'm completely fascinated by uh, medieval Islamic maps. And of course, of sometimes the very experiential way they, they tell the world. Um, well, the, the question is very, it's a very good one. Uh, one of the main challenges of the dissertation was to face the fact that I was working with something called the Arab world. What is the Arab world anyway? How it was built? And, um, what I, uh, I mean, I departed from this category that of course overlaps with the Islamic one. Um, with the Islamic world one, I mean. But I went for, I went for maps that were, I mean, that had to do with an Arab world as, 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 as we know it in a modern sense. So at some point in one of the choices I had to do was to leave the idea of an Islamic world that it's also a uh, a notion that I should uh, dive into deeper, uh, but I, I, I really, I just focused on, on this idea of Arab world explicitly. Okay, thank you very much, thank Simon you. O'Meara. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Rich would be an understatement. Like Anna, I wondered when, if you would raise uh, the question of gender. And like Karen, if you would mention maps of the pre-modern Islamic world. Thanks for the when uh, the dissertation is published as a book. Anyway, thank you again. We'll never look at maps uh, <laughs> in the same way. <laughs> Sorry, again, without asking ourselves about their hidden undersides. No, I created you a, a, I don't know how you say talk. I created you an obsession. <laughs> I will be guilty for that. You will be just looking at maps, like what is not being told here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Simon. I actually, uh, even if he hides there, Simon is uh, the responsible uh, of uh, the fact that I started diving into these things. He uh, supervised many of my essays at SOAS and uh, it was the the person who actually pushed me to go further into this idea of inhabiting. And um, it's, uh, I, I would love to say just a small thing that this all started as a very, very personal experience because I couldn't find uh, my place in London. So uh, actually he was telling me, look, you have to, to, to look at yourself, how you make yourself at home. How are you feeling at home in London? So basically what I was trying to, to, to examine in an academic sphere became, I mean, I became like the test. I became the, the laboratory. I was looking at myself to understand what, what other people were trying to convey in their artworks. And I'm uh, very, very thankful for that. Um, I wonder when if uh, you would raise the question of yeah. gender. 
I don't know when I will uh, work on that, but it's I, I, I repeat, it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting uh, terrain. I will have to step into at some point. Many people is asking that now. I'm, I I mean not here only, but I'm starting to feel embarrassed <laughs> because I think I really need to to go there. I really need to to explore that further. Uh, Pre-modern Islamic world, that's also a very, uh, a very interesting thing I would love to, to dive into. In the dissertation, I briefly mentioned uh, the relationship between art and cartography in the Islamic, uh, pre-modern Islamic world. I briefly mentioned how, uh, I mean, I didn't do that research on my own. That's why I don't want to share it here, but uh, other people have uh, have explored this uh, convergence of art and cartography um, in a non-professionalized world in which many craftsmen uh, were doing, craftsmen, sorry, were doing uh, this kind of maps and so on. So I, I won't go into that now. Um, but I think, of course, uh, we have uh, so many kinds of maps to look at and uh, so many proposals, uh, not only regarding the Arab or Islamic or whatever world we're talking about, but also in, in relation to many other places. So uh, it would be interesting to, to dive into all of them. Um, but um, I think uh, even though many researchers uh, let's say, overlook the importance of comparing what artists do in relation to what it has been done in a cartographic field. I think I am almost ready to, <laughs> let's say, forget maps and go for something else. I mean, to focus on the, on the artist side, sorry, and uh, maybe not be comparing every time with uh, previously made maps. And, um, what else? Uh, ah, when it will be published? Well, that's a big word. I think now I will have to, that's another big garden <laughs> to, to do all the editing and to see what stays, what, uh, what goes, what everything, especially because in Spain, I, I, I believe in the UK, uh, dissertations are shorter. Here we do like huge books uh, that have to be uh, very much worked to to be launched in the format of a book, of course, but that will be a great challenge too. Thank you, Simon. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Uh, Jayanti Merotra, I would be very interested to know how you conceived of this theme for a PhD, which has led to the other activities you mentioned, or was it vice versa? Was it something on the MA that sparked your interest? I find it very creative with scope to go in many directions, even intuitively. So you you partially answered that. Yeah, actually, actually, you got me. <laughs> I mean, uh, you anticipated uh, the answer I, I gave previously. Uh, yeah, mainly at the master's, uh, what sparked my interest was that this idea of living in a, in a foreign city where, for me, at least uh, loneliness, but especially feeling, uh, feeling a foreigner was something a bit um, endemic. Um, so finding my place and also trying to uh, share with my colleagues and with the friends I made there, how was my home back in Spain, for example, what were my routines, uh, somehow uh, made me realize that the places are very connected to the actions we do. Uh, with maps, I've always been fascinated with maps. But I confess that even though I love maps, I'm very bad at using them. So maybe one of the things I could say is that maps don't show the world as I see it clearly because the right is not on the right and the left is not on the left. So I really need maps that are made otherwise. So maybe I could say that too. Uh, that's an important thing. And finally, um, in Spain, uh, even though we have a very, very uh, strong historical connection with the Arab world, um, there are a few people working on contemporary art. And especially uh, still, we uh, daily see many pre preconceptions, prejudices. We uh, see that uh, basically there are many imageries that are do not correspond with what uh, the people who inhabit 
whatever is the Arab world um, have. So basically, another thing that sparked this interest was first to win a dissertation on a topic people were not working on in Spain, and second to challenge uh, the imageries we have and uh, to prove that maybe there were other possibilities and other ways of talking, of approaching and of, um, of conceiving, uh, not only maps, of course, but uh, the Arab world. So basically, I think these are mostly uh, some of the, of the things that come to mind when, when, you, when I read this uh, conceiving the theme, PhD and so on. And then the other activities I mentioned uh, were actually a result of the dissertation. So um, I was brought to many different places, but I'm particularly interested in the ones that are uh, not exclusively academic. As you very well said, um, I work very intuitively and I like uh, the challenges I can find all, of course, academia is full of challenge. I don't say so. <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, you have many things to face. But I think uh, out of academia, for me at least, in such an experiential um, research, I have a lot of things to, to learn. So, uh, so basically, what I'm doing is just uh, follow the, the current and try to, 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 to explore and to learn in new, in new projects. Karen, I look forward to your book. Happy to share map images in my collection. And Simon, to everyone, Maria's dissertation is, as you might expect, <laughs> on the basis of tonight's talk, brilliant. And I, for one, cannot wait to see it published. <laughs> Thank you, Simon and Karen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Can I just ask you a last question? I, prom I promise you must be exhausted by now. I, I, I told you if it went very long I would open a wine. <laughs> I told you before. <laughs> I just I was wondering uh, you know you talked about the uh, this artist that, that um, uh, work with textiles um, so and, and embroideries etc. Um, I was wondering what material did they use for, for, for textiles and embroideries and whether the material has any significance in relation to the maps they're doing? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, with the artist I worked for the exhibition, I showed uh, the images, I can uh, show it now because I have on the slide, I think, uh, no, not this one. Well, uh, Asma, uh, which is the one uh, that work on palm trees and uh, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, Tigris and Euphrates, so the uh, Iraqi rivers, uh, which is um, this uh, lady here. Uh, I didn't uh, bring the, um, the big piece we brought by her, which is a huge burlap uh, with all the rivers embroidered on it. She takes the two rivers, she actually takes them, uh, they is she isolates them from the map and she embroiders them in different materials. And in the case of uh, the big piece, it's very interesting because she uses burlap uh, because she says she found out that palm trees are part of the Phoenix family what means that they easily adapt uh, to live in foreign terrains. So basically she says palm trees as I am, they are migrant beings. So uh, in the case of this burlap, uh, it's very interesting because Asma, what she does is to take the textile that they use to cover the, the head of the tree before uh, the tree travels. So basically she says is uh, the traveling dress the palm has. And what she does is to embroider there the rivers so uh, that when the palm tree gets to a new house, she doesn't forget that she can actually grow there. So for example, with asthma, the textile has a lot to do with uh, what she's trying to convey. And in the case of uh, Filwa Nasser, she works on very, very different materials. For the exhibition, we brought uh, three pieces. Uh, this big one on tulle, which is an evocation of the abaya. Uh, then uh, we brought also four pieces on archive paper that I didn't uh, put into this presentation. And the one you can see on the right is a project she did for Sarja, which is called Tactile Mapping. And the title says it all. Uh, it's, a, it's a work that is made on, la on latex, uh, on natural latex. 
uh, which is a reference to the skin. So what she's doing actually is uh, a reference. Uh, well, I mean, it's a very long story. She works on the last um, in inhabitant of a house in Sharjah. And what she wants to do is to offer her a sort of metaphorical body to come back to this house uh, she was expelled from. So uh, basically this tactile mapping, she uses this latex as a way of building her address, building her a new space with this architectural plan. Uh, to enable her to re-inhabit this house again. So yes, in the case of Filwa, the different materials have a lot to do with the, with the, with the message uh, she's trying to convey. Uh, with Christine, she works on archive paper. I mean, she's uh, working with this reference to archive. So it's, uh, it has not, I mean, it's not a particular thing she has with uh, the material, but on the very big textiles that are um, framing the Aleppo uh, reconstruction deconstruction project, uh, she um, used how you say uh, she used um, sea wind machine. It's the only artist that didn't do this uh, by hand. Uh, she's actually saying the sewing machine, and then we come back with gender, is something very related to woman. I want to uh, do my map uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this machine, basically. So she doesn't use a particular material that uh, is related to the message she's working on. But uh, yes, the, the, the technique, it's uh, definitely something uh, that has to do with it. And finally, and I, I finish my long answer, um, Amina, uh, in this uh, very specific project, uh, she worked with uh, wool and wire. And uh, this has to do with a very uh, deep concern Amina has with uh, a craftsmanship in Morocco. Uh, she has uh, spent the past, I don't know how many years, I think past 30 years, uh, traveling across Morocco, trying to do a map on uh, the different workshops that are doing traditional craftsmanship in the country. And she found that the best way she had of uh, preserving them was actually collaborating with his artisans and inviting them to collaborate with her in, in the artworks. This is one she did uh, during lockdown uh, in COVID. So basically this is one she only worked with another person with the with the chef d'atelier, but um, the materials have more to do with this preservation of the land in a different sense. I mean, the preservation of this craftsmanship that speaks of, I mean, ancestral traditions. Thank you very much, very interesting. And uh, thank you very much for, for a very uh, good seminar, Maria, and that prompted such a wonderful discussion. So a thank virtual you. applause. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, um, uh, I wish you all the best for the future and for your project. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this uh, virtual world for a while. <laughs> it's yes. also a world to be mapped, I think. So thank you so much. And uh, I, I hope to, to meet you sometime in person and yes. to share more projects in the future. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Everybody. bye.